Hello everyone. <clears throat> this is the um, second video lecture of um, our week one in art and archaeology of the ancient Near East. So in this um, video lecture I'd like to tell you um, a little bit about um, this class, an overview, offer an overview of the class so that you have a good sense of what you should expect um, uh, from, uh, from, this, um, from this class. So um, this includes um, precisely how we will study, uh, debate, think about um, the ancient art uh, from the ancient Near East, um, art and architecture, and what are our methods and what are our sources. Um, I'd like to talk about that a little bit. But this also involves, um, I'd like to comment a little bit about the sort of geographical extent of the course uh, as well as the chronological uh, limits that we're going to draw. Um, and I'd like to also um, add some comments at the end about why it matters to study ancient cultures of the Middle East today. What is the relevance of this material? What is the relevance of studying, um, um, studying the um, history um, and the art and architecture of, um, of the ancient Middle East. And um, I will touch on the question of cultural heritage as a kind of a contested political um, uh, concept um, these days. Um, and it has to do with identities and, uh, and, and so on. So I want to um, remind you that this is a um, this is also an edu general education um, course. It, it satisfies gen ed requirements um, as an understanding the arts um, course, but also as the understanding the past course. So um, uh, I believe some of you um, students in this class are, are not just from classics and art history, but from all over the campus, uh, from different departments and fields. Um, so I'm going to try to keep that in mind um, um, throughout this uh, semester, and this is really, this is really fabulous. Um, uh, so um, this makes our class uh, really um, uh, diverse and vibrant. Hopefully, we will have a lot of fun on in the Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings and discussion board discussions um, all the, all the time. Um, we um, we do have um, a textbook for this course, um, or a, a book that we're going to continue reading week by week, um, and that's a really quite brand new book, um, actually, um, that was published uh, relatively new to, in 2017 uh, by Zainab Bahrani um, and um, The Art of Mesopotamia. Um, and um, we're going to um, publish by Thames and Hudson in 2017. We're going to be following this this uh, book pretty closely, uh, and um, uh, you could either get a hard copy of this book uh, from the bookstore, from UIC bookstore. Uh, but if you prefer an ebook, that's going to be available through the. Um, uh, through the blackboard that you will see when you go to the blackboard on the menu, you will see the textbook uh, access to the textbook uh, through the UIC bookstore um, as well. And this is a very exciting book for me. Um, Zeynep Bahrani teaches at Columbia University and she's one of the prominent sort of art historians um, working in the, in, um, on uh, ancient Near East. And um, actually, last time I was teaching this class in 2017, um, she visited uh, UIC campus and she met um, uh, some of my, stu uh, my students in this class, uh, which was a, we had a very fruitful discussion with her um, at, that, at that time. So she's, um, she's a, um, a wonderful colleague and very, uh, very influential art historian. Um, and this book is beautifully um, um, prepared with um, really wonderful illustrations um, and, and also beautifully written. So I'm hoping that you will enjoy um, reading chapters from this book um, throughout the semester. But we will have other readings as well um, to supplement um, some, of the, some of the aspects um, of, um, uh, of our weekly content. 
So the, the geography that we're covering is quite um, an equally diverse and very complex region where at the end of the Ice Age, um, we find the earliest communities in, um, the, uh, in the Middle East to be, um, uh, to be cultivating wheat and barley and domesticating sheep and goat. Uh, and these are, um, in fact, uh, native uh, species in, this, um, in the area that is known as the Fertile Crescent. And we're going to talk uh, about this um, this this title um, in uh, through through our reading it's a very interesting concept uh, but this is this um, this green area that you see on the screen uh, that stretches the uh, the sort of area uh, the the border zone between Turkey and Syria Turkey and Iraq but also continuing into the Levantine coast in Israel Palestine Lebanon you know the western Syria this is the area where we saw uh, the sort of earliest uh, human settlements um, in the Neolithic, in the Stone Age, um, for the first time. And these are the people who cultivated, uh, started agriculture um, as well. Um, so that's something that uh, we're going to study more closely in the beginning of the, um, of the, of the, uh, of the semester. But further down in Mesopotamia, on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers that you see on the map with uh, represented with several cities uh, with Sumer, Babylonia, Elam. That area is uh, in southern Mesopotamia. That's the place where we see the emergence of first cities, um, the, the so-called urban revolution um, uh, uh, as, as, as well. Uh, but before we go there, actually a very interesting development it was this in this fertile crescent that we were talking about this this kind of uh, sort of uh, semi upland um, foothill zone um, uh, in um, uh, in in north in the to the north of Mesopotamia um, is where these early um, hunter gatherer and agricultural communities kind of really developed. One very fascinating uh, discovery in recent decades is the site of Göbekli Tepe, where, um, where archaeologists discovered, um, particularly a German archaeological team, discovered an incredible um, uh, sort of a ritual site, uh, a mountaintop ritual site belonging to hunter-gatherer communities, and this is before agriculture. Uh, this was a place where hunter-gatherer communities were coming together for feasting, uh, for eating together, but in these kind of circular ceremonial buildings that had um, uh, these really elaborately shaped, uh, finely carved and decorated T-shaped pillars that have um, representations of wild animals um, on them. And this is, you're seeing one on the left, um, a, a, a roaring lion. Uh, for example. And so this is an interesting, and uh, when this site was discovered, and notice it's, it's an 11,000 uh, uh, years ago. So this is one of the oldest um, sort of monumental architecture that we know from Near Eastern prehistory, and we're going to spend some time in the coming weeks um, on this. Um, I also like this map uh, because it shows more broadly the geographical regions that we're going to um, cover um, in the class, uh, from the Black Sea um, in the north uh, to the Persian Gulf in the south, um, and from the Mediterranean Sea to the west, um, and the, uh, all the way to the Caspian Sea to the east, uh, and all, uh, even Central Asia. Um, so it also shows how sort of really vastly different these uh, environments and topographies in this region. Um, in Anatolia and in Iran, you're seeing um, a lot of the sort of uplands, mountains, um, mountainous and, and kind of uh, plateaus um, uh, as well. Um, uh, whereas, um, uh, uh, to, uh, whereas on the Mediterranean coast, in the Levant, the Levantine coast was very much very powerful, very strong in 
participating the Mediterranean seafaring trade networks. Um, we will discuss that more closely for the Bronze Age, for particularly for the late Bronze Age, and how the Mesopotamian world actually connected with this uh, international um, Mediterranean sea network, right? And so, um, um, really, um, that's um, uh, that's something that I really liked talking about because that's the point when. Mesopotamia starts to connect with the Aegean, with the rest of the Mediterranean, uh, and as well as in Egypt. And Egypt becomes a major player uh, there as well. Um, uh, but also then in Mesopotamia, the, another very different environment is southern Mesopotamia. We will see a very marshy, very watery environment watered by these two major rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Um, and it's a lowland, uh, sort of really swampy, um, uh, sort of watery landscape. And actually, that's where the first cities um, kind of really emerged. So we will be studying in the first half of the, um, of the class, uh, focusing really a lot, uh, particularly in the, uh, pre um, in the sort of early prehistoric periods, but also in the Bronze Age, we will be uh, focusing on southern Mesopotamia quite, uh, quite a bit. Um, in these early cities of Mesopotamia, we see the flourishing of an urban elite that, um, uh, an urban elite culture that became uh, very much involved in international trade, in um, sponsoring works of art and architecture, building temples uh, and palaces during the Bronze Age. And, we're going to spend a few weeks actually studying this urban culture, um, and I'm showing you some examples of uh, these kind of votive statues from Tel Asmar in southern Iraq, um, which is really quite interesting because these, um, um, uh, by coincidence, these statues are actually um, at the Oriental Institute Museum at the University of Chicago, just in Hyde Park. Um, so hopefully the, um, uh, the pandemic will be over soon and these institutions open freely and you can visit um, uh, pretty, um, pretty quickly. Um, I normally, teaching this class, I normally take my students to the Oriental Institute and the Art Institute to see uh, some of these um, works of art. Um, but unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it's, it seems unlikely, but we can see how things develop later in the semester. Maybe we can, um, we can um, uh, organize a nice socially distanced visit uh, with smaller groups if, um, if, that's, um, if that's possible. Um, in this class, uh, you will get um, a chance to also to do an assignment uh, on writing about an artifact like these, uh, like these statues um, at, the, um, at the Oriental Institute. Um, and um, uh, and do a visual analysis. Take uh, take one object and do a visual analysis. And we have uh, the Oriental Institutes, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the British Museum. Uh, they all have very extensive ancient Near Eastern uh, collections um, with uh, works of art, and and they are they have virtual um, uh, exhibitions. And so you can actually go online and visit the websites of these museums and actually study an object um, there. So uh, one of your assignments um, is, is really going to be geared towards uh, picking a work of art from one of these three museums um, and studying them um, and writing about them and um, sort of um, really thinking about them um, as well. So uh, we'll, um, you'll hear more about that from me um, later. What is important then uh, is that these works of art that we're going to be studying in this class um, are really, they don't really um, fit into the kind of standard definition of art as it is discussed in contemporary art or modern art, but it has, it offers a much wider variety of objects to study, right? That are surviving from ancient cultures of the Middle East. And we're gonna really, keep our eyes open to um, different kinds of objects um, and not the ones that are strictly identified as art, right? And so this is very, very important. That's why 
That's why I also include this concept of material culture that refers to um, that refers to this idea of um, uh, non-elite um, sort of um, objects, things that we live with, uh, that we work with, um, right? So, um, for example, um, looking at these images, uh, for example, the uh, pottery vessels that are built, that are made to store food, to preserve food with painted decoration on them. We're going to study these kinds of pots. Musical instruments uh, that are used for funerary rituals. Um, you'll, you'll see one on top left. Um, uh, the statue of an Assyrian king. Um, that was actually very ceremonial, very, very ritual, maybe placed in a temple or placed in a sacred space, and elaborately carved uh, from li limestone. Or an ivory plaque. Uh, in bottom left, you see uh, that probably belonged to um, a furniture, um, like a bed or, um, or a, a throne, maybe. Um, a marble figurine you see in the middle bottom, um, a marble figurine of a voluptuous woman from the Neolithic, right? That's that's from the site of Çatalhöyük in central Turkey, um, for example, or, or a golden dagger that's specifically built to be buried with a royal personality in the city of Ur in southern Iraq that you see on uh, top. Um, cylinder seals, seals that belonged to merchants or some kind of admin, someone in, in the administrative role in a palace or a temple. Uh, you see on you see them on top right, uh, three of them, where you can actually seal. Um, you can this is this was the sort of ancient signature of having this kind of really cylindrical um, sort of um, uh, instrument on which. Uh, images are carved. Uh, so if, if you roll your seal on wet clay, then you somehow have some kind of a visual signature to um, to seal envelopes, to seal um, objects, to seal containers of food, um, what what have you. It's very important uh, in terms of in the management of food and management of trade um, as well. Um, or monuments like the one on the bottom right, the stele of Naram Sin from the Akkadian Kingdom, and of course, which is um, one of the famous um, works of art. We're going to focus on that um, uh, a little bit um, as well. Um, uh, um, Naram Sin was an Akkadian ruler um, who lived in the third millennium BCE uh, it was an, uh, of the Akkadian Kingdom. Uh, and this particular stele, with its inscription, with its um, images, imagery, it tells the story of a, a military expedition of Naram Sin to the Zagros Mountains um, uh, and his victory over the Lulubi tribe, who's being depicted here begging for their life or being killed. Um, and so both a kind of a victorious, glorious representation, but also at the same time pretty violent um, as well. So this uh, this kind of monument, um, this idea of narrative, this idea of telling stories with pictures, telling stories with pictures, with monuments and with, with, uh, with text actually that accompany them. Uh, you can see that the little mountain on your right actually has an inscription that's carved on it that actually is part of the monument. So this idea of studying narrative, this forms of storytelling is, is an important aspect of this class. And we're going to talk about visual narratives, pictorial narratives um, uh, quite a bit. And also uh, the idea of the public monument. I mean, this also gives us um, really interesting ideas of how Mesopotamians conceived of uh, public monuments, um, how they disseminated their state ideologies, how they organized uh, history and tried to impact the writing of history, uh, and how they um, sort of really influenced large masses with their, uh, these, this kind of state politics, this kind of uh, performative, this kind of um, monumental um, sort of works of art.
And this is something that we're going to really discuss um, quite a bit. I'd like to wrap up my lecture actually by referring to um, uh, to why it is so essential and so urgent and so important to study these works of art uh, today and um, from the Middle East particularly and the question of cultural heritage. Um, in the current uh, climate of wars, military conflict, climate change and other threats in the, um, in the Middle East has been sort of really has shown, has resulted in uh, actually an unprecedented threat um, to cultural heritage, something that we had not really seen um, before. Um, and it became particularly apparent with um, with the work of the Islamic State. I want to give an example of ISIS, the Islamic State, um, and the vandalization and destruction of archaeological sites and artifacts and museums um, in both Syria and Iraq, which we saw intensely in 2014 and 15, uh, particularly, um, uh, you'll remember the debate around uh, Palmyra as well, um, and destruction of some uh, architecture, it, the Triumphal Arch and whole uh, group of uh, buildings there as well. Um, and the interesting thing is that all this destruction was not just quietly taking place, they were actually being circulated in the global media with YouTube videos and with, with these kind of carefully curated images violent images uh, like this one uh, particularly where we see a, an ISIS militant um, sort of hammering the, um, um, the uh, Assyrian uh, reliefs in the palace of Assur Nasrpal II in Nimrud near the city of Mosul in uh, northern Iraq. Um, so this closely relates to actually very extensive looting that's actually taking place in archaeological sites in the Middle East. Um, so I'm showing you a site, the site of Joppa in Iraq, um, taken in 2003. Um, and all of those little holes that you're seeing, it looks like a moon's, moon surface, right? And um, all of those holes are tiny little looting holes where illegal diggers have come and um, dug up either cuneiform tablets or ancient artifacts uh, to sell. And these things then get sold in the international market um, and sent out um, to, um, to collectors and museums um, around, um, around the world. Um, but of course, as you can see, um, the context is lost, uh, the scientific study becomes impossible, um, and the information that we would gain in this kind of contextualized scientific archaeological study of archaeological sites um, is completely damaged in this way. Um, uh, for example, um, this um, I'm, I'm showing you this um, uh, this really interesting um, lion lioness figure um, that was um, five thousand years old. Um, from from the Bronze Age in uh, in in um, uh, from Mesopotamia from from Elam actually, um, and um, and it, this was a this uh, announcement is as uh, is actually reporting that this tiny little lioness, which is actually about three and a half inches, um, and I I I, I brought um, uh, this faience Egyptian. Um, uh, a figurine, uh, replica of a faience figurine from the Metropolitan Museum, and this is also like three and a half inches. So this is that. Those are these are the um, a similar uh, similar size, um, and um, uh, and so this was sold for five, fifty seven million dollars um, in the year of two thousand seven. Um, which is uh, really incredible. Um, within the same um, same auction, there was also a, a painting by Pablo Picasso, which sold for twenty nine million dollars. And this 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 little piece, you can see how contested 
this, these kind of artifacts, this kind of art um, is, uh, is from. And this is an artifact that you can imagine that was looted uh, from one of those looters halls um, that you just, um, you just saw. Um, and so you can see how this kind of really inflated illegal antiquities market also uh, it's kind of fueling this kind of destruction in the Middle East um, as well, this kind of heritage destruction. So I wrote uh, an International Herald Tribune article with, with my colleague Christopher Whitmore um, together, and this was uh, right after the sale, um, critiquing and pointing out actually how this kind of um, um, sales, actually how damaging they are for the loss of archaeological knowledge, for the loss of scientific work, and the loss of historical knowledge that we would gain from these um, artifacts if they were um, if they were excavated scientifically in their um, in their places. So, um, the question of this kind of um, uh, cultural heritage um, and what it means today. Um, um, this is something that we're going to discuss in this class um, quite um, quite a bit. And I will leave you with this wonderful sign. Uh, uh, I have a photograph of from an archaeological site, a tourist sign from an archaeological site in Egypt that kind of really beautifully summarizes this concept of um, um, working on um, ancient Near Eastern art as being being in the embrace of um, of history. So, um, I look forward to your discussion, our discussion on Thursday. Please bring your questions and, um, uh, uh, and thoughts about, uh, about these lectures um, as, well as, the, um, as well as the reading. So um, uh, see you uh, very soon.